to the Snow West Show. I'm Ryan Harris, your host of the Snow West Show podcast. Um, do you want to throw a plug in there? Go to snowwest.com. We're hitting our 50th year of uh, publishing Snow West magazine. Pretty awesome. It's it is it is pretty cool. I I that means you're old though. We would, I am very old. I didn't know if we'd be around doing magazines for 50 years, but <coughs> let's we, say 50. What does that make you? About 55 then? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that happens. No, I'm I'm 45, so I've been around for the majority. You started of this before. I didn't start. Oh, all right. <laughs> no, okay, we'll roll with that. Yeah, I started there you go. Before I was born. Oh, yeah. Boy, yeah, that was pretty fun. Yeah, you should have seen it back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was good. Like like, uh, um, I grew up in it, and there wasn't a mountain industry. There wasn't a mountain segment mm. within the industry. Yeah. Up until uh, I, the first mountain sleds came out in like '92, '93, '94. You know, Polaris got aggressive with their SKS. Mm. Skidoo came out with the Summit, which would be like the first true mountain, yeah, purpose-built mountain sled. Uh, everything else is kind of a long track trail sled, but to see the mountain segment within the snowmobile industry grow, yeah, and then what it's turned out to be is is like four or five of the the top ten selling sleds in the industry have been mountain sleds for yep. the last 15, 20 years. Yep, and it's it been that long. Yeah, so twenty. What was it? 2010, 2011 is when when the the, the 2011 Pro RMK mm-hmm. yeah. became, became the mm-hmm. top selling sled in the industry. Yep, that year. Good. And then the M7 sold really well, you know, years before that. So the mountain sled segment has really it's been taken off. It's gotten yeah. bigger pretty much every year, hasn't it? It has. It it it's fluctuated. You know, with yeah. everything else, it's gone up and down. We we see the numbers, and the numbers now are nothing like what they used to be late right. 99s, early 2000s. Uh, but man, they sold a lot of snowmobiles. Oh man, yeah. But, but we're also twice as much, three times as much. Mm. Yeah. Oh, easy. Yeah. So let me introduce who we've got here. We got uh, Bruce Kerbs to my right, uh, Snow West test writer, uh, part of the Snow West test staff. Uh, he's helping his co-host here today. We're at the Idaho Snowmobile Show, and we're sitting in the Ibex booth. Uh, we're here with William Clausen and Alex Clausen of Ibex Performance. Am I saying that right? Just Ibex, but yeah, we're performance driven for sure. So it Ibex, works. <laughs> with, with Ibex. Uh, and I, I'm sure the majority of you out there have heard about the Ibex turbo system that, that these guys have built for the Catalyst. And that's, you know, we're, we're days or weeks or not even months away anymore. No. Nope. Getting that thing on the snow, but we're really <laughs> close to that. But we're going to talk about the Patriot Boost because that was another sled that we rode of yep. yours last year. And you guys do clutching and tuning on that, fuel mapping. Yep. And that sled ripped. Yeah. That, and that was a that, that's a 23 that that we rode, correct? Yeah, it's it's a 22, but I had a 23 flash on it, so okay. It was it was a 23. I mean, nothing really changed besides the mapping, which we we had updated because we try to keep up with the sleds without having to buy a new one every year. But yeah. it's uh yeah, it's got the 23 calibration on it, which we really really liked over the 22 thought they made some really good changes yeah they they did i mean every year they come out and they do they improve the fuel oh yeah calibration yep. they improve the shock calibration yep. include the clutching some of the sourced components change mm-hmm. brands you know stuff the consumers don't see but the the sled does change quite a bit year yeah. to year. oh yeah and, and a lot of people don't realize that like the 22 patriot boost has the boost has gotten a lot better since 22. oh yeah oh yeah just from a stock level you, oh, you go back to like 2020 the first Chaos RMK that came mm-hmm. out, that thing changed quite a bit, just in mm-hmm. their in their shock calibration and the way it handles. But yep. Um, so what all have you done? This what all have you done to that Patriot Boost? This is the one that we rode, right? Yep, yep. So we did uh, we did clutching and tuning on it, and then we put our air intake vents on it. Um, one of the biggest problems we had was trying to get the air to it, and you can you know along with clutching, you can have as much horsepower as you want, but if you can't get air to the motor, it's never going to produce it. So we came out with a slick design that bolts right on over the, uh, you take the stock one off, it bolts down, and um, that helped the engine breathe. It took away the bog um, that we would have. And then um, I actually changed to a different track a little bit, one that trenches a little bit more. I've My cousin rides a ski uh so he wheelies a lot, and I was like, that looks cool, so I wanted to do that. Um, and then the clutching, we worked, we worked a lot on how our clutching profile works with the boost because we felt it didn't quite have the bottom end that we wanted. So we, we changed the profile to make it not shift as fast, which gets your RPM a lot faster and it makes it a lot more snappy. That's the main thing we focused on. And then obviously your mid-range and top end pull when you're going through the trees and you need it. So 
So, and Bruce, you've, that's something that we've talked about before. Yeah. Like Patriot Boost versus Skidoo Turbo R. <coughs> the, the power comes on at a different range. Yeah. And, the, and I feel it comes on with the players too late, mm. especially in the tight trees. You yep, know? yep, yep. Your Skidoo feels more ready. Yep. Yeah. Your Polaris has got to wake up a little bit. Yep. I mean, yeah, once you're in the boost, it's, players, players runs great. It's phenomenal, yeah. It's that yeah. bottom end. But sure. anybody can move that. Like, they, they, you can use your clutching and, and mm -hmm. like you're talking about, get it, get where that power curve kicks mm -hmm. in, get to get that to drop down. How does that work? Well, William could get more into the uh, technical side of how it works. I just try to make it look and sound pretty, so. <laughs> as long as it goes fast when you squeeze. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I've got a boost clutch kit here, but <clears throat> a lot of our secret sauce is the shape of the weight here. We do some little tricks. I don't know if you can see it from here, but we do some little tricks at the very beginning here. A little flat spot. Yep, a little flat spot here that gives the uh, engine essentially time to rev before you start to shift up too quickly. And that's just that little blip of time that it takes to get the turbo on. And then it starts to shift like a house of fire. And that's where you start seeing the track speed and, and uh, <clears throat> mid and top that you get. You know, the boost is known for. And we even see little bits of gains in the mid and top as well over the stock stuff. But our real focus was that bottom end. We wanted it to feel like a ski do, and and I, I think we accomplished that as far as, as you said, being ready. You know, you're creeping through the trees, and you got to give it a little blip to get around a tree, and it's there. You're not going uh oh and hitting the tree because you're not ready. <laughs> right. What what's happening in the primary? Like, what is it doing when you put that flat spot on the on the weight? Like no, that's a that's a really good question. Um, the weights. A lot of people think that they're RPM based. I mean, there's a lot of guys that think that you're at 8600 and you're here. <clears throat> well, actually. This whole ramp shape and how far the clutch is closed is based on track speed. So when you're at the bottom end and you're off boost, this whole thing is out and it's sitting right in that flat spot. When you hit the throttle, it slowly, I mean, a lot of people think, whack, it doesn't. It slowly progresses along this ramp. And what we do is part of the trick is hitting that timing correctly as to when to transition from what I call the spool section to the fast section, fast shift section. And so we actually, as Alex mentioned at the beginning, we slow down the shift so that it acts like it's a lighter weight. <clears throat> I mean, they're lighter anyways, but it acts like it would be, let's say, a 9R weight where, or a 850 weight because this is an 850 motor. So it would act like a 850 NA weight for the first little bit. But then you've got to shift fast once the boost comes on because now you got power. So you go from, say, 140 horse to 180 just for argument's sake. Um, you have to bridge that gap. And if you load it like it's 180 when there's only 140, it's sluggish. Cause you're, and that's what you feel when it's lag. I mean, the turbo itself takes time to accelerate. You can never eliminate that. For sure. Fact of physics, right? But if you make the motor have all of its 140 horse, from a rider standpoint, it feels good. If you have that power like it was an NA850. So you almost got to time your turbo with your engine yes. on that bottom end to come in all at once. Yep. Where you're trying to get at. That makes sense. The 850 has, the 850 we feel revs a little bit slower than the old 800 did, and the 9R obviously they've, they've gone back to that quick revving, you know, type deal. But one thing that we got when we when the ski -Doo turbo came out was it spools instantly and when you look on the logs it's like the slowest spooling turbo out there but because they because they bypassed everything they're harnessing all the 850 uh, engine horsepower that they can and so the turbo it actually took about two seconds to spool from from the time you hit the throttle to the time to full boost and on the on the old turbo the only 160 horse is only four pounds of boost at 8,000 feet so you know it was pretty slow for four pounds of boost but it, you couldn't feel it because of how smoothly they brought it in. And so with the boost, we felt like it was a little bit overloaded at the bottom. So we were transitioning that 100, and instead of instead of from 140 to 180, like William was saying, it was like 100 horse to 180. So you felt a big difference and then you start to feel the turbo lag. And so what we did was we tried to harness it because it wasn't overloaded. And so we don't let the clutch shift as fast. It gets to RPM faster. And then we start loading the motor, you start bringing the turbo in, and then it just pulls like a house of fire. And that's kind of the way you felt 
when you were riding it, you know, going across the trees, it, it had a, just a rippy feeling, you know what I mean? Like, like the 9R, not quite as good because the crank's heavier and all that, but it really, what we try to do is slow the shift down just a little bit to get it to RPM as quick as possible because when you start to load the motor at 8,000 RPM, you're going to build boost a lot faster than if you try to load it at, you know, two to 5,000. And so that's why, that's why we work really, really hard on the profile side of stuff and, and harness the bottom end, you know, with the mountain segment that everybody loves, that's what we focus on is the tree riding. Everybody's gone to tree riding now. Yeah. You know. So what does that do on the back shift side of things? So so now you can as you're accelerating you can get it to load easy quicker. We don't we don't we don't gone. you don't it's just full throttle. You just all the time. <laughs> There's no back shift? No, no, you don't need a back shift. <laughs> we took our brakes off of ours. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. That's part of why our package always includes a helix. We kinda gave up on what everybody calls a stage one clutch kit. Because with our, our weights, the aggressive profile, we're a lot lighter, but it, with the different shift, this dual stage shift essentially, let's call it, we needed to be able to harness that with our helix angle. So we have one of the most complicated helix angles in the industry, and that gives us the ability to have an instant back shift. We want I mean, that's the other side of it that always bugs me. I watch videos of guys riding, and they're full throttle up a hill, and they come across somebody's trench, and you can hear that motor, whoa, and it comes back. We don't like that. So we, we run. So what, what causes that? Like, so explain why uh, that's, that happens. That's good. When you load the motor down, it, you think about it in a manual transmission. If you suddenly go up a hill in a Dodge pickup, it'll start to lug down a little bit. Turbo comes in, and they try to get up. If it's steep enough, they got to shift down to the next gear. The helix senses that load change. It senses the change in um, weight, essentially, from the track hitting something. And if it's not sensitive enough, the motor's going to lug down, and it'll take time for that helix to rip the belt back out of the primary. Because the primary only knows how to shift up. It doesn't so know staying anything. So staying in a higher gear. Yeah, it's staying in a higher gear. It wants to shift up, and it doesn't want to do anything else. The helix is telling it, no, 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 slow down because you're going to overload yourself. And it starts ripping the belt back out of the primary to shift it down. And then as soon as, as, soon as you get back on the same snow you were on before, the helix is like, okay, we can go again. Let's shift. So we use, we use relatively shallow helix angles. Because our weights are being so light, we can, we can do that without destroying the ability to rip the belt out of the primary. <coughs> So, I mean, forever, my, my clutch tuning knowledge, I mean, I was more into it a long time ago when I was a mechanic, you know, you kind of get into that. But a lot of times at the Arctic Cats, you've got to, we always took grams off our weight. Mm -hmm. So you're mentioning your, your weight is lighter. Yes. Um, but you've got a different angle. Is there that fine point of too light, too heavy with your angle? Is, is, are they adjustable? Yes. So I've got a little 3D printed version here, but we use magnets to adjust. Okay. And... We've had some flack for the magnets because these screws are easier. The reason being is the location makes a huge difference on different track speeds. Because like I said, your, your roller is changing where it is on the ramp at different speeds. So with the screw, you can't adjust, say, 0 to 10 mile an hour because you just stuffed all the weight in the tip. So that's why we stuck to the magnets. They're not quite as easy as the little screw thing. Um, but they are still quick and easy compared to the old-fashioned <laughs> punch a rivet in like the old right, ones used yeah. to be, right? Um, then our shape of our profile here, you can kind of see this center weight here that sticks up is a stock 10 series Polaris profile, which is what 99% of people use because it's a well-known profile. It's been around since the 80s. Um, most people just make them fatter or skinnier. They might put screws, like I said, or weights or magnets in them. But essentially, that's what they work on. Um, we work on the whole shape. The reason being, um, let's just pretend these magnets are a roller. If your roller is fixed here, um, as you go up in path, the weights push the, push the sheaves open. But when you're out here, most of your centrifugal force is going up which doesn't open the, or close, sorry, doesn't close the clutch. So we, if we re-angle this, now when we're up here, we have more energy pushing towards the belt than blowing off into oblivion that's completely useless. 
So and that's why we can lighten the weight up. That makes sense. So we end up, it, it depends on the on the sled, but we're anywhere from 10 to 25% lighter. And in the extreme position, like the new Polaris Pro R Razor, we are, um, what, about 45% lighter than the factory yeah, profile? We, we, that one's extreme. <laughs> we, run, we run about, I think we're at 95 grams at 420 horse, and they're 114 grams at 225. So we're way lighter with a lot more horsepower. But and that, just your angle is compensated. Just, just the light. angle. And that's the thing is, is everything is done off of force. The weight, the center of mass, the profile, that doesn't matter. It's all done off of force, of how much force you want against the belt and where you want the force against the belt, you know, what, how far it's closed and open. So that's the thing is when we curve the profile and we can run lighter weight, we get the question a lot, well, why don't you over rev? Well, it's because we got the same amount of force that you'd be running if you were running, you know, stock, but we're doing it more efficiently because we're not wasting as much energy. And that's kind of the whole idea behind our clutching is, is to not waste the energy. And so with the lighter weight, now coming into the back shifting, when you dump off the throttle, you don't have a bunch of mass sitting there turning and having to slow down when you, when you let off and get back onto it. So the, the response time is a lot faster. That makes sense. So, so having a lighter weight is, is a quicker response. Exactly, yeah. yep. Because yeah, when we grind our weights, yeah, if you went too much, you'd over rev. Yeah. Then and we back I mean, to the drawing board. So yeah, the whole force lightweight thing, that's, uh, makes, yeah, that makes all sense. Your like springs and, and your helix angles all come into that. That's why when we first started our business, we, we messed with the primary quite a bit. And we didn't really know much about a secondary, to be honest. Um, then we started figuring out. We, we went back, met some clutching gurus that I think the guy's 85 years old now. And we talked to him about his secondary and stuff. Um, high tech. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. He, so Dwayne Watt, he... He taught us a lot on how secondaries work and why why he never messes with the primary and stuff like that. And and then we came out with a package that was substantially different than what we had begun with and the secondary. That's why we don't sell the stage one very much. Right, and that makes sense because the technology's advanced so far yeah. that, that you gotta do the whole thing to get the most yeah. benefit out of yeah. it. The, the primary spring though, that's has that changed to where it's, it's it used to be just engagement like mm -hmm. but is it is it more than that now yes definitely and especially when we start running these aggressive profiles <clears throat> the top end spring rate is incredibly important to making sure that the shift speed is correct um, we run different ranges of springs depending on the application some of them stiffer than others but our primary goal is if it's too soft, it becomes really hard for the secondary to pull it up, pull it through the clutch. If it's too shit, st <laughs> <laughs> edit, of. edit. <laughs> yep, cut. There's lots of things. That are too shit. <laughs> if it's too stiff, um, then it doesn't want to upshift. <clears throat> you'll you'll hit. It's crazy, um, but sometimes you'll hit RPM, but not gain any track speed. Yeah, and that's often from too stiff of springs. They oh, just, that's how the old powder specials were. Yeah. yeah. You'd it'd rev to the moon and you would just you not yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. 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 No, I had something on the catalyst earlier this week. We were pricking around trying to finalize our clutch kit, and I had a wild hair idea. I'm like, let's try this, see what it do, and go out there, and it just snaps to RPM. I'm like, man, it sounds good, but it's, it's not, not going, going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> not very fast. We were like, uh-oh. <laughs> So, so how do you how do you dial in the the spring rates and everything? Is it just purely trial and error, or do you have like? Oh, you, it sounds like there's a lot of math involved. That you I get a understand. yeah, no, you get. A, I mean, it, I mean, it's trial and error, you know. But you do get a lot of like he has a lot of knowledge on what might work. You know, he has been off a few times. I always remind him that just so he <laughs> keeps his head, you know, small. Right. But but it's most of it, I think, anyway. Yeah. No. There's there's. Um, a lot of it was trial and error at first, and then you get experience, um, and it's different for the different profiles, and that's the hard part. You know, when you start, a lot of people are used to the 10 series, so they can, I mean, one clutch to the next is different, but a lot of people are like, this is the spring I use, this is the helix I use, now I'm just going to adjust my weights, which is great, which, you know, one maybe bad thing about the angle, or the profile changes, it takes us longer to release a clutched kit than somebody else because they 
hit copy paste on the factory stuff and change springs a little bit to what they're comfortable with and I'm not going to argue it doesn't that it doesn't work but what we're doing is a lot more high tech and you can see it when you're right 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 <coughs> what do you guys think of the p22 you know i i don't hate it it was a little tight to work with there's not as much space in there as the p85 so our profile i didn't i wasn't able to put exactly what i wanted in there but it seems to be shifting pretty good. We haven't had terrible issues with it. Um, I know people are blowing them up, but knock on wood, we haven't yet. <laughs> we I've talked to a lot of guys in the industry that, that don't seem to like it, but we've, I don't know, there's a P85 conversion for the boost, but I mean, I don't know what you thought when you wrote it, but I, I felt it reacted just fine. Yeah, when it's set up well, it, it feels great. Yeah. And and most people won't pick up on, on what everybody else is talking right. about. Like, it's a, it's a good clutch. Yeah. It, yeah. And it helps get rid of the belt deflection issues. Yep. And mm -hmm. that's that was probably the biggest thing with the Polaris. Yep. Nobody yep. was constantly dialing their belt deflection. Yep. No, and, and I personally feel like um, quite often new stuff comes out and it gets bad rap for a little while. <laughs> and the P85 has been around for a really long time, so there's a lot of lot of knowledge on how it works. So it's going to take time to figure out the new clutch. It is different. <laughs> for sure. Are you guys doing a different cover on there as well? We have not cover. We, we have not gone down that road. That's a the one on there is a, I've got a BDX one, a Black Diamond Extreme one, okay. and it funnels in um, airflow to it. But I've heard that. Covers are the problem. The movable sheave. I think the 9R. They went to a billet spider now and and stuff. But knock on wood, we haven't had any issue. I think that thing's got just over a thousand miles of abuse and some Ryan Harris abuse. So yeah, <laughs> a, little, a little bit of that. Yeah, we're yeah. In, you know, for good measure. Um, so let's go to the tuning side. Like you're doing fuel mapping on these. How does how does your tuning system work? So. Um, we have full full access to everything in the ECU, um, and we've been around the industry tuning for, man, I've been tuning since 99, I think it was, when I first started tuning. The Bender Turbo Kits on the RX-1? Yeah, we did that in 01, 02, or sorry, 02, 03 is when yeah. that one came out, right? Um, the, old, the old carbureted stuff, and then Apexes, and... M7s and <laughs> you name it. We've played with boondocker boxes and, and uh, Dino Jet. Dino Jet. I never did play with the Dobex, but um, ECU tuning I've been doing on diesel trucks and then later on F 150s, gas trucks and stuff from like 06 on. Did his Subaru in 2011. We built a compound turbo kit for it. Um, so. I've been playing with tuning for a really, really long time and have a vast knowledge of how an ECU works. Um, that gives us, I believe, a pretty big advantage <clears throat> to our competitors because when we go into the ECU, I know what's going on. Um, a lot of people, it's kind of trial and error. Like, here, let's try this spot. And I've looked at tuning, not saying they can't make it work, but they're messing with the wrong stuff to get the results, what I call they band-aided one thing to cover a problem over here. And so we focus a lot on the bottom end as we do with the clutching <clears throat> and fueling being right, too lean or too rich, and it'll kill the power off the bottom. Because the motor doesn't have any energy in it, right? They don't, the pipe's not, you're not on the pipe, you know, you think, a lot of people think of being on the pipe as the old 125 and 80, you know, <laughs> dirt bikes, but same thing with a snowmobile. When you're down at the bottom end, you're not on the pipe, you're not on boost, the motor doesn't really want to rev. Factories do a great job with their power valves and and porting to try to give it as much umph as possible, but the fueling is massively important down there. And so we spend quite a bit of time getting that dialed in, <clears throat> and timing is really important as well. So we tweak on the timing as well um, to get that response, and then the cool thing about the factory turbos is they use electronic valves for the turbo wastegate. Um, Alex already mentioned it on the ski to you, the boost is the same concept. The timing of when that valve closes, because they actually leave them open. Like a lot of people think of it as a conventional turbo where your wastegate's closed and then you open up and you hit boost. They actually leave them open 
a little bit. And the reason for that is to let the engine breathe at that low RPM because you're not going to build boost at 2,000 RPM. You're just not. So let the engine breathe. And that's what they do to get you a better bottom end 850 torque and power. <clears throat> and so the timing of that when it opens and closes is incredibly important to when the boost, the power comes in. And, and that's, that's because if, if that were closed off bottom end, you have to let the exhaust get in there and turn the turbine. And there's a delay in that. It's like yep. you're waiting for all this to happen. Yep. And so when, when you're out on the snow, that's where the turbo lag comes yep. from. That's all the waiting. So they've, they figured out a way to bypass that, but you guys have a way to make them better. Yeah. So com we, we figure, out, figure out when, um, essentially, when that motor starts building torque, we start bringing that valve in so that it doesn't choke the engine, but... It, the turbo's getting lit when it wants to. And then when it comes to our clutching, you stack it on top of it. Now that timing changed, right? Because um, with us letting the motor get RPM faster, we can start closing that valve faster. So you put the two together, and it's exponentially better. One thing we've seen a lot with <clears throat> with our competitors is that, that valve timing. Um, they would go in there and just turn the boost up. And when we did that, we were faster, but the bottom end was sluggish. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, you, you, you can look at these maps like you're saying, and the map will tell you, this is your timing map for exhaust valve close. This is your timing map for exhaust valve mid. This is your timing for the open. And, you know, you've got your fuel maps, and then you've got acceleration maps and all that. The biggest thing is figuring out when those come into effect and how. And because of the knowledge that we've had, you know, where we, where we used to work and, and stuff, he was able to kind of track, like, that wouldn't make sense for that map to be active at this point, or it makes sense that this one is. And so with the wastegate, we spent a lot of time with the wastegate on that, trying to make it so that when we get, when we turn the boost up, we don't lose the bottom end that the factory does have, um, because they did dial it in pretty good. I mean, they're, the clutching, you know, we can help there. The tuning is, I mean, everything's, you know, they build it to work really well, but what we were able to do is kind of back off the, the wastegate to make it not close as fast when we turn the boost up because of the way the mapping works. And that's, that was huge for the bottom end because him and uh, uh, another guy were like, your tuning kind of sucks. And I was like, well, bring it on. And then we went up and rode and I put it back to stock and I was shocked. I was like, holy cow, it's way more responsive. I'm like, I don't even want to run my own tune. And so that's when we dug down, we sat down and we started trying to figure out, okay, why... Why does it feel sluggish? Because, I mean, in a 100-foot, 200-foot race, we were faster. I mean, there was no doubt because we were pushing two, three, four pounds of boost. But the bottom end was just sluggish, and that's what we hate. And as mountain riders, that's what you hate. You've got, you need that power now. You know, you come around a tree or whatever, you need it now. And so that's what we spent a lot of time trying to dial in that wastegate when the turbo came in and when we want it to, to, to light and when we don't want it to light. Harness the engine power and harness the turbo power. So how are you changing the fuel map? Is it is it a plug and play box? Is it just a clean reflash? So yeah, that's a good point. We have, oh, I should have grabbed one. We have what we call our goat tuner. <clears throat> it is an ECU flashing tool that um, you can buy and plug in. Um, you can select your tune and then you can take it off. It's a full remapping of the factory ECU. It's not a piggyback system. It's not a it's piggyback, a, yeah. So explain what a piggyback system is. Like, like if somebody was into modern or sled 10 years ago and they hated it, mm. it's a different style. Yeah, right? like it's, yeah. It's no, you're thing. right. The, that actually came from, from the background we come from. Bully Dog went away from, from piggyback boxes. Um, piggyback boxes, basically, you plug in line with the ECU, and it goes, it goes into the ECU, and then when it comes out, we go, hey, instead of you know, six microseconds of fuel, we want eight. So the ECU actually has no idea that anything's happening. And although that was the old way of tuning, it's an okay way of tuning, but when we completely remap the ECU, now the ECU know, knows what's going on. So exponentially, like with oil, there's a big thing with, you know, oiling a two-stroke. That was one of the main things. Piggyback boxes, they don't, the, the ECU has no idea that it's using more fuel than what it says is coming out. When we remap the ECU, it automatically adds more oil because it knows that the injector is pushing it harder than it used to. So on the CATS, that was one of the major things when we used to do it on the old um, non-turbo uh, like axes and, and um, the Pro. 
it would automatically add the oil. So we didn't even have to turn the oil up because it would automatically oil more because it knew that there was more fuel. And that's kind of the why we always have gone towards ECU flashing, which well, has, and, has and helped. I'm sure people that have used piggybacks, um, I know um, one of the uh, <clears throat> racers that we sponsored last year on the Catalyst was worried about it because he had a piggyback box on his other race, his last year's race sled or whatever. And he was like, well, you know, I go from this race in California that's, I can't remember, 3,000 feet or something, go to Jackson, you're at 6,000, there's one in Colorado that's like 10,000 feet. And he's like, I got to remap every time I, you know. The problem is, is the ECU is trying to adjust fueling according to your altitude. And then you go in line and try to change from that. There's two problems. The piggyback doesn't know what the ECU is doing, and the ECU doesn't know what the piggyback's doing. And so inevitably, you have to tweak that tune. When we get into the ECU, same thing with the Catalyst and the Boost and the ski we can make sure that's correct at every altitude, and they're not fighting each other. They're not, you know, backdooring each other, because both of them are arguing, essentially. It's like two, two electronic devices fighting each other, and... So it'll work here, it'll work for your riding style, but then you go over there or you let somebody else ride it and you gotta tweak the piggyback. And so with the ECU tuning, it's so much more consistent and that's what that racer, he rode our catalyst for the race season, he was worried that he needed a piggyback to be able to adjust it because he can't adjust our tuning. But by the end of the season, he's like, I never had to touch it. It was flawless the whole race season. Yeah. So how important is fuel, especially on these factory turbos? I hear a lot of talk about that. Like, As far as the octane you talk yeah, about? Yeah, the octane, just, just the quality what? of gas. Quality of gas. How you run whatever. <laughs> okay. Ain't no big deal. There's, there's, there's some alcohol over there. Reason. Just throw it in. Diesel. <laughs> Good 88. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good solid 88. You'll be fine. <laughs> um, fuel is very important, but it's often misled. Mis Leading. Misleading. And there you go. Yeah. I got you. I got you back. <laughs> oh, <boy>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of people, especially I know that there's a lot of, ben well, there was early, I think the 23 and now the 24 will find out what their tuning's like is a lot better. But the early 22s had a lot of problem with detonation. People were struggling because it would debt on them. Mm -hmm. Detonation um, can be, the sensor that senses it, I guess let's explain that, is a noise sensor or a vibration sensor. So if you bog, you can feel it in the handlebars, right? Yeah. There's, there's a buzz. The sensor will pick that up and it'll call it knock, but the engine's not knocking. So um, the quantity of fuel is very important to make sure that you don't have detonation issues. Too lean, cylinder gets too hot. Too rich, spark plug goes out. You get a vibration detonation. You can get um, one thing people don't understand or realize is when the ECU tells the spark plug to fire, it will fire every time. A lot of people like, oh, blew the spark out. No, what happened is it delayed the spark. So now if you called for timing, let's say 10 degrees before the piston gets to the top, you might actually get an ignition 30 degrees past. So then you get flame out the pipe, you get heat on the piston that wasn't supposed to be there, heat where it's not supposed to be, and you make no power. So all of that, the fueling quantity is actually insanely important to make sure that the octane is usable. Um, so we, with our up to, what are you running, 30 horse tune? Stage three, yep. Up to our, so the stage two, the 20 horse tune, we don't require any octane advance. Um, we don't see knock because we get the fueling correct. Um, you have to have good 91, though. You do want good 91, so there is a problem with that. A lot of people think that ethanol-free is the, the bee's knees. Is the equivalent of high octane. Okay, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, there's one big reason for that. Most of the time you go to a pump that has ethanol-free, it's on its own pump. So when you pick that nozzle up and you put it in, you are getting 91 octane. <laughs> When you go to pumps that have E10, you'll notice you can select 85, 87, 91, or, you know, it depends on the area you're in. Right. But they're all on the same hose. What people don't realize is you can get up to two and a half gallons, is it, up I think? Up to three gallons. Up to three gallons of up. whatever fuel the previous guy selected. Mm. So if the last guy that filled up there was in his little Prius, or his little yeah, Prius. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> filled there, up. There are, there, <laughs> <laughs> there are those no, guys. No, uh, yeah. you know, it just... 
average car rolls up there, they filled it with 85. You could get up to two and a half gallons of 85. So a lot of people blame the ethanol mm. for the bad octane. It's not the ethanol that caused the problem. We use E85. That is 85%. 85% ethanol. Ethanol is a wicked good uh, race fuel. The problem is you're not getting 91 octane out of that pump. So it's 30% in your 11-gallon tank that you're running, right? If you get two to three gallons a year. So it's not even 91. That's that's the biggest problem with filling up out of, you know, someone where it's the same hose of all three of those. Whereas when you get 91 non-ethanol, like he was saying, it's out of its separate hose. So, so what do you do, like, in Utah? You can't get 91, 92 ethanol free. You can get 88 ethanol free. So yeah, no, you would want to get, you would want to go for the 91. There's a couple of tricks that we've done. Carry some gas cans with you. Yeah. Fill a gas can fill and fill your can. sled. Yeah. Or what we do we got a trailer full of sleds. Fill up the stockers first. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Go <laughs> dump it into your kid's run, little 400, you know. <laughs> we run you we go. run Lucas Octane Booster, half a bottle yep. per tank. That's that, the other trick. It solves it. It's easy to carry. You know, you can have four boxes, five boxes sitting in your trailer. It's easy to carry half a bottle per ride. I mean, we go through anywhere from half a tank to a full tank on a ride. And we just dump a half bottle in there. It just solves the whole problem. It right. adds it adds three octane points. So if it's 91, you got 94. If you get stuck with something that's 88, you're still over the 91 right. mark. Is there so. down, downside to having too much of that in your tank, though? <laughs> nope. We haven't had any issues with that. I've dumped it's the bottle in before. It's not exactly like race gas. No. Um, so that's the other thing on the octane. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No. That's, that's, just, that's the other thing with octane. There's a lot of people are like, well, it's easier. I'm going to just go buy VP110 and pour a little bit of splash in it. <coughs> that actually is worse. You can fix tuning problems with it. <laughs> but something people don't understand is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the word stoich. No. Stoichiometric. That is, the, that is the scientific number that 100% of your air and fuel is burnt. Pump gas is 14.7 AFR. Um, okay. Well, the issue is different fuels have a different stoich. Now, E10 has a stoich of 14.2. So that's the other side where sometimes people put ethanol fuel in. If they forget to switch it on the dash of the Polaris, it'll actually run rich because it's fueled for a different stoich number. Now, other brands don't do it. They fudge the numbers. You can. There's a range of safety, right? So if you hit the middle of the safety, it's okay if you go either way. Problem with race fuel is you get VP110 and their stoich is 15.2, so you got to take fuel out to make it run. So you could end up too rich. You go get Sunoco 110, exact same octane, great fuels, but it has a 13.8 stoich, so you got to put a bunch more fuel in. Hmm. So you could go put Sunoco 110 in an engine tuned for VP110 and burn it down. And it's not the fuel's fault, it's, it's not the, the octane. fault. It's not the octane. It's not fault. a lack of octane. It's the change in the stoich of the fuel. And Avgas is the same way. Yeah, Avgas has we a high stoich. We like Avgas for the airplanes, but not for, not <laughs> for our sleds. Hmm. It's designed for a low RPM, low compression motor. N not those ones. They're high <laughs> compression, high RPM. <laughs> <laughs> There's as much horsepower in those things that there is in, like, the V8s and V10s and whatever they run in the planes. So, <laughs> you know, we're spinning those, and it, it, the fuel's not designed for it. But... It, it will work. I mean, if, especially if you tune on it, you can get it to work, and it will work fine. So that is the last point of the deal. So Stoich is one. The other side of it, which uh, Avgas is really bad for, is the burn rate or how fast it burns, right? Most people have probably played with lighting gasoline on fire and lighting diesel on fire. You just pour it on Never. the ground and light it up. Yeah, Never. I didn't think so. Um, All day. <laughs> when you do that, you'll notice the diesel burns. It's like kind of a real slow it'll sit there and burn for a while you light the gas and it's like whoosh well there is a difference between race gas and pump gas in that same way not to the extreme of diesel but that changes your timing in your engine so if you again put race gas in an engine tuned for pump gas you can burn it down from excess heat from a delay in timing hmm. and avgas is really slow so we it's, have for an example <laughs> with that we were running q16 in my razor pro r and we had we couldn't figure out we would it would start off on the first run and we'd get about 15 pounds of boost about 9200 rpm and it's just ripping on the first drag and then we come back and it would start out at 9200 rpm at the beginning of it and it would be at 15 pounds of boost 14.8 or something like that by the end of the run we were at 16 pounds of boost 
or 16 and a half at 8,200 RPM. Mm. And we went all over the board with clutching, all over the board. And so finally, it dawned on us that our timing was just too low. So we went from 22 degrees of timing to 27 degrees of timing. Our, our boost, so what we were doing was we were actually starting a fire in the exhaust, which was bringing our boost up, and our wastegate couldn't get rid of it oh. because it was, we were basically retarding the timing. And then our, we were losing RPM because we were actually dropping power. And so what we did was we brought the timing back in, and then our boost came down, but our RPM went, came up. So, yeah, we, we built more boost, but it wasn't more power. It was a lot less power because we were dropping 1,000 RPM by the end of that thing. And that's, that was kind of the, the second thing that we were like, wow, that timing is obviously really important. We knew that. But for me to, to see that firsthand was like, wow. And that's why the fueling is very important. What fuel you run, you can't just go... That's got 110 octane, that's got 100, that's got 95, you're good to go. It doesn't quite work that way. If you tune it for a specific fuel, it's, it works fantastic. I mean, pump gas, pump gas is, you can build a lot of power. I mean, what are we, 180 horse, 200 horse on them now? Mm -hmm. So so why do people just go grab airplane fuel or whatever and dump it in just because they, they think it's cool? and Well, it's easy and it does protect, to a certain degree, the octane side, but... A lot of people, a lot of tuners have actually tuned on AV because it's cheap. But we tune on Lucas because it's cheap and we first Even have... Even easier to get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's easy to carry. You know, that's that's the biggest thing is it's just so much simpler to carry rather than filling up cans and mixing 50-50 and yeah. all that stuff. So Yeah. yeah. So but, if, if, a, if a customer comes to you, the best setup they can get for a Patriot Boost is is the tuning. And what, what's, the, what's your box called? Goat. The goat tuner. The goat tuner, mm -hmm. and then then your clutch kit, which is which is both clutches, mm -hmm. and then what else are you trying to get them into? The velocity intakes, the hyper velocity intakes. Before That's before we go into that, um, I want to talk about the goat tuner itself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're using a device that is Wi-Fi accessible. So initially, when you buy the tuner, um, you'll go into your shop or whatever, plug it in, and um, connect it to your Wi-Fi, and it will automatically download our latest tunes. Now, the cool thing is, is it saves those latest tunes onto the device, so you can go into the mountains as long as you have a little battery to plug in. You can change from your stage one, two, or three. You know, you, you run in on stage one, and you decide you want to beat your buddy. You throw three in there and go kick his butt for a minute, and then you decide you want to creepy crawl across the hill and keep flipping over backwards and turn it down if you want you know it's up to you and you can adjust it in what is it on 30 seconds i think minute and change your tune the other thing that's really cool is we're the only one in the industry that also offers logging so you can data log if for some reason you find any strange thing happening like we've caught things like ripped reed boots because it's like damn this lead doesn't run right hit the log go look at it and you're like oh this is happening. This is happening. So, you know, you got weak pipe springs and your springs are catching. You got, you know, there's a lot of engine related things. And when you log all that data that the ECU sees, you can see it and they can log it in the mountains, get back to their shop, connect to Wi-Fi, and they just push upload hmm. and we have it at our on our server. And they can actually look at it too. A lot of customers like to look at that kind of information. They can actually, yeah. they, can't, they can't adjust the tune, but they can look at the log themselves and see oh, I was running this, you know, this boost, this is what my EGTs hit, this is how much my injector's running, you know, stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of guys that ride that, that love to just see and look at that kind of information, so it's definitely accessible for them to look at their logs and see what they were running. So if, you, if, cool. you, if you add the, the air intake into that, and then what, what stages of performance can you get out of these things, out of these Patriot boosts? You have like three stage? Yeah, we, have, we just have a 10, 20, 30, most of it. I've got... I've got a 40 and 50 we've done, but it's, there's not very many people that run it. I haven't really had anybody that asks for it. And in the mountains, it's, you know, you, you start running into intake air temperature problems and um, you've got to run VP 110 or Sunoco 110 or, you know, a higher octane. So I haven't really pushed those out at all. But um, with the intake system, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of one of the most things that I've heard of people complaining is, is in the deep powder, they just they bog and they you know people are constantly doing this and so you know the way it's designed is is it slides the the snow slides off and then it's actually it's about five with both sides it's about 550 percent more surface area um so those are 
you know, the main, the main things that I would do, the first thing I do is the intakes because it helps a ton even on a stock boost. Um, then you're clutching and you're tuning probably second and third. The so are, clutching. Are you, you're cutting a little bit of the panel? Nope. Nope. Oh, you're not? Nope. It sits through. right. Yep. The only thing you got to do is drill a hole. Well, you don't have to, but we recommend it. Drill a hole and you put a pop, a pop rivet in there so it holds it down just a little bit. The one on that sled is, is uh, it's about two inches longer than our, than our version now. Um, my, because I'm not very tall, I didn't ever hit it, but we've had a couple of uh, taller guys and really aggressive riders that have um, broke. Catch it on their knee there. Yep. So we shortened it up for them, um, and that's the version we're sending out now. So, so the first thing you recommend is the air intake. Mm. Yep, and that that would just help a bone stock sled. Oh yeah, this. yeah. You, I haven't quite proved it, but I am pretty comfortable in saying that I gained about 150 RPM just putting it on because the engine can breathe. Um, the stock one is pretty restrictive in there, so opening that up makes a huge difference. And then, I did forget to mention which one of my dealers got mad at me for not telling. But on the right hand side, we have a valve that if those get plugged, it will open. Um, we have a powder bog valve built into the right hand side one so it'll open and it'll suck hot air if it needs to just like what they're doing on because right. hot air is better than no air yeah because <laughs> yeah, on the 23s they changed the, yep. the air intake box yep. to prevent that collapsing when yep. there's no air available yep. and so we so built that in doing the same yep we built that in underneath um so you take the exhaust vent off and put that on there and huh. then you have and it only it only opens when they're when it's yeah, lacking. Yeah, it's under a spring. So as soon yeah. as there's enough vacuum, that light little spring will whoop. Which I, I don't even know if it opens because there's so much there's so much surface area there that it that it sucks from. So I've been in. I, I last year last no, year I ne I never <laughs> I never thought you could stop a modern sled. I really didn't. But last year we got in some stuff and it was a perfect opportunity to test those. So we've got some videos and stuff on our website that show going through some deep stuff and I never suffered a powder bog or anything like that so so what are those re retail for they are 419 for both sides you can buy them separate if you want I'm a symmetrical guy so I don't like it if they're not both on there um, I think the left side is 238 and the right sides 219 or something like that I can't remember so it's a pretty simple install at home for yep everybody. two screws two screws yeah you First pull the side. fuel cap off um, and then pull the hood off so you can kind of see back in the back but it's two screws and you drill a hole for a pop rivet if you want to, and you're done. So okay. you don't you don't cut or modify your stock one at all. So if you sell it, you can transfer it to your new sled. Yeah, and then your clutch kit would be your next yep. step that you would. Oh yeah. Send people to. Yep. And what what does the full kit run? Four forty nine or five forty nine? I can't remember off. No, five forty nine. Yeah, I, I think I off the so. yeah. with two springs. It actually comes with two primary springs. I thought um, secondary spring, and then we have. Um, some roller bearings that we put in the bottom of the the helix, helix. so that you don't get uh, spring bind, which helps quite a bit with your back shift. Oh, it just separates the spring yep. from the helix. Yeah, yep. yeah. So it okay. So we use a we use a needle bearing instead of the typical Delrin or D Duralon or whatever they are. Delrin. Washer. Yeah. <clears throat> just yeah, it's actually a Delrin roller bearing. Washers. So. so it's an actual roller bearing, which lasts a lot longer and is a lot more. A lot slicker. And then how do you change the magnetic weights? Like how, once they're in the cam, we have a a tool. You can either pull the cover off, pull the belt out, or we have a what we call an advanced collapse tool. Um, and you just hook it over the back sheave and the movable sheave, pull it, and it collapses it. And then you can we use an Allen wrench to to pop them in. He's really fast at it. I'm not so much. <laughs> so do you have clutch kits for Polaris, Cat, Skidoo? Yes. Yep. And nope, not Yamaha. Although we did, but not anymore. Sad day, sad day. Yeah, yeah, that is sad. We yeah. are Yamaha guys from heart, but <laughs> they just—I don't know. We're cat guys now. <laughs> hey. Well, yeah. I know you're a Polaris guy, so I here. have to say that. I have <laughs> to say Who that. Says I'm a Polaris guy. <laughs> oh, come on! You can see the enjoyment in your face you got over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm 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 a uh, I'm an adrenaline guy. There yeah. you go. That's true. And that, well, that thing that thing Willie like that thing ran because we were uh, we were riding a 23. We had a 23 prototype with us when we rode that. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. We had the free ride turbo yep. 146. Yeah. I think I don't think I was there that day. No. Yeah. You weren't there. Justin was there. Justin with was us. there. Yeah. It so, was a 146 because I yeah. So you we, let me hop on that. We had been on model year 22. The model year 22 Patriot Boost like with just bone stock setup was a little doggy mm -hmm. it wasn't like the 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 
most screaming right. factory turbo out there. And then we had the prototype free ride turbo, and that thing ripped. That that thing. It was. Oh, cool. wait, we were on twenty threes. So we had yeah. done, we had done twenty two boost, and and we all kind of thought that the turbo, the Skidoo turbo, was a little bit better yeah. setup. Yeah. And then the twenty three boost was a different calibration. It yep. ran a lot better. The airbox mm -hmm. cleaned up a lot of things. The twenty three Patriot boost ripped. I love that. We had a we have a chaos. 165 with the 275 on it. Mm -hmm. And then this year we're running a, a Chaos 155 or 55, yeah. with the 325 on it, the Patriot Boost. That should be an animal. That is that is probably my favorite sled going in. I mean, to your point, that's probably me, my favorite sled going into 24 is the Chaos Patriot Boost 155 with 325. Well, we'll get you back on that catalyst. We'll get you. Don't yeah. worry. Well, <laughs> I'm, and I'm looking forward to that too. But, yeah, uh, <clears throat> those things run so dang good. But this one. Worked pretty good for you. It it did. It was just so responsive. Like like uh, the, the Patriot Boost that we have been ridden, been riding. So the 22s and then the 23s. Um, they're just not as responsive on, on the mm. stock stock setting. I mean, so what you do mentally, you just adjust mentally. Mm. Yep. You stay in a higher RPM range, and you try to do everything a little bit faster ground speed. Mm. Yep. Which means you have to open up your lines. Yeah. So you can't do the real quick turns, and you have to be in a little bit more open spacing in the trees. Mm -hmm. But it's an adjustment that you make. Yeah. And then I get on that thing, and I'm like, wait a minute. Now I can tighten things back up. And just harness. Can, yeah. It's we just try to harness that low there. end. Yep. Yeah. And that, that thing ripped. That was such a fun a fun sled to get on. Yeah, I really, I, really I loved it. With the 23 calibration, then that one's got the 30 horse on it. And I I, I thoroughly enjoy the sled now. I love yeah, it. I think it's, blast. yeah, it's it's rippy. So So are you excited? Let me shift gears here for a second. Are you excited for the 858? Yes. Start start shifting gears on the turbo and build a boost kit for that. I'm yeah. sure. We yeah, hope so. We hope so. <laughs> yeah. Time we gotta will tell. we gotta you get the six hundred. Yeah. yeah, we 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 got a project to get that six hundred out right now, but <clears throat> yeah. Hopefully uh, about everybody that I've talked to that ordered a six hundred was like, Okay, it's I'm only getting this sled because yeah. I'm putting a turbo on it. Yeah. No, I think it's it, it's phenomenal. It really yeah. is. No, uh, we we sold so many more than we ever expected. And Hopefully everybody will have them this before Christmas is the goal. So yeah, good. Maybe we'll have snow by then. Too. Yeah, maybe yeah. we'll have snow. That, Hopefully be, we have them by, by the time there's snow. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about this whole weekend doing these shows. Just like it's it's funny this year because we have sleds mm. that are here and no, no snow. snow. Last year, <laughs> yeah, snow, no sleds. Yeah, snow, no sleds. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's kind of leaving their sleds at the dealer. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'll pick it up when it snows. So the first storm we get. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be, be a dealer. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say the dealers probably better get them already so that they're not scrambling. Yeah, you know, they're probably leaving it in the crates. Oh yeah, we can have that thing built by well, Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's been uh, great having you guys on, uh, Alex and William. We appreciate uh, all the good info. No, thanks we'd, for we'd love, having we'll us. Diving deep into the technical stuff, and you guys, you guys understand what you're doing and the clutching aspect and all that and the tuning. And what I want to do is take one of our so I, I mentioned that the Chaos 155 Patriot Boost with the 325. I would love to take that sled and just put your clutching on it. Yeah. Fun. And just play with that. Mm -hmm. Take all the stuff I love about that sled, bring the power curve down to a little bit lower RPM yep. so I can do things at a slower ground speed. Mm -hmm. And just, I think we'd have a ball. Yeah. yeah. Fun. Well, let's I do it. So. so All right. Where, where can people go to find out more about your stuff? Ibex, www.ibex.com. Okay, and then you guys are on social media as well? Yep. <clears throat> yep, Ibex underscore LLC, I think, is our Instagram page, and then Ibex LLC, I think, in our Facebook stuff. Um, and then we've got TikTok and, and uh, yeah, Do TikTok we have X Instagram. Now? I'm not sure. No, not, I don't think we're on X, Twitter. Yeah. Not well, on Tinder? That's a very short one. I don't think so. Okay. All right, just making sure. <laughs> just swipe up for that one. Yeah, swipe, <laughs> swipe right. Up, swipe up. All right, well, hopefully we'll be out on the snow soon. I want to yep. get a, a, a ride report on that Catalyst Turbo. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. sounds good. All right, thanks, guys. Thank thanks. you.